SpeedGrade has a couple dozen video effects that you can apply to clips and to adjustment layers. I'm going to show you most of the effects in this lesson. To follow along, start up SpeedGrade, open project, go to Working Files, Premiere Pro Projects, and open up SG Effects, and click on Open. We're going to work on two clips, the women on the bench here, and this shot of the coastline. We'll go back to the women on the bench by pressing the Home key. I've already applied a large number of effects to the two adjustment layers. If I click on this one here, there's the layer stack with some effects in it. You click on this one over here. Same thing with more effects in this particular one. We're going to take a look at all of those effects. An item of interest here is that all these effects taken together are stored as one Lumetri effect back inside Premiere Pro. So you can do all sorts of work inside SpeedGrade on a Premiere Pro project. Save it, go back to Premiere Pro, and if you want to go work on that particular Lumetri effect again, simply open it up back inside SpeedGrade and all these effects will still be listed there for you to work on them individually. So before we get to work on effects, I want to talk about stacking order. So I'm going to click on this first clip here, and I have the primary layer there plus an effect above it, and the visibility of the effect is turned off. So to see how the stacking order works, I'm going to reduce the saturation in this primary layer by just going over here and dragging saturation all the way to zero, making it grayscale like that. And now I'm going to turn on sepia tone and see what happens. And what happens is probably what you expected to have happen. We added the sepia tone to that black and white clip. Now this is not what would happen inside Premiere Pro. If we had an effect here above another effect inside Premiere Pro, the one down here at the bottom would trump the one above it. The stacking order in Premiere Pro is from top to bottom, meaning the effect at the bottom of the effect stack inside the effect controls panel affects everything above it. But the stacking order here inside SpeedGrade is from bottom to top, meaning the thing on top basically covers up what's below it. It's the same way that products like Photoshop work, where the layers on top cover up what's down below. So if I take the sepia tone and pull it below the primary layer, the desaturation of the primary layer will desaturate the sepia tone as well. So I'm going to delete the sepia tone effect here by pressing the delete key, or I can click on the garbage can like that. And I want to reset this guy so that we get the color back by clicking on reset. So let's just take a look at the effects. You access them with this little plus sign down there, click on that. And there are all the effects. They're all effects, with one exception, that's LUT. LUT is a lookup table. When you click on that, you essentially add a container to your layer stack in which you put a lookup table. So I'll click on that, and by default, it adds the Cinespace lookup table inside that container. But you can change to another LUT by going over here and clicking this little drop down arrow there and selecting a LUT from this list. I'm going to be talking about lookup tables in a different lesson. So I'm going to delete this guy by just pressing the delete key. To add an effect to a layer stack, just go down and click the plus and select one of these guys. And just as an aside, there is no reference document that explains these effects. So I'll try to give you brief explanations of most of them as we go forward here. I'll select sepia tone again like that. When you add an effect, it frequently has a unique set of controls unique to that effect. Sometimes there are no controls, but in any event, there are controls for that effect and you can then adjust the controls over here. I'm going to delete this. Now let's take a look at the adjustment layer above it. And I've applied a bunch of effects to the adjustment layer. I've grouped the effects on the adjustment layers kind of by how they're related. Scroll on down here. The first one's called ASC Combined. If I click on that, nothing will happen. ASC is the American Society of Cinematographers. That organization has a standardized way to evaluate how things are adjusted for tonality and color, and they use three controls called slope, offset, and power. So if you want to comply with their standards, you would use something like this. Then they could glean information from these controllers here to determine how you adjusted the tonality and color here. Turn that off. The Kuahara filter is kind of like a mosaic. I'll click on that. It gives the clip kind of a mosaic look there. You might be able to barely see that there. The 7x7 filter has a bigger mosaic look than the other filter. There are two Kuahara filters. Now notice there are no controls here. So how do you adjust this? Well, you adjust it using the opacity up here. So if I want to reduce the impact of this effect, I can slide this opacity slider left. Now when I click on it, it shifts like that, which is a characteristic of speed grade. So you're not really seeing the final output when you click down and move this thing. But I'll slide it left there. And then we have to kind of eyeball this and kind of go, well, that's not exactly what I wanted to do. I want to make it more. Unfortunately, when you click, it shifts to kind of a larger version of what the resulting effect will be. Just be aware of that. I'll reset the opacity by clicking on this. And the opacity slider works with only the selected layer anyway. I'm going to turn off the visibility there. There's a reason why when I clicked on the opacity slider that the image changed, and that's because of a setting in preferences. To see that setting, go up to preferences here by clicking that little wrench there, and go to dynamic quality. When you look at playing and pause, these settings will probably not line up. That's the default setting there. 
And the reason for these different settings is if you have slower computers, this helps them play back nicely. But they're set like this by default. And if they're different, then when you click on an effect or click on the opacity slider, or to a certain degree, when you click on a color wheel, things will change inside the display. So the playback on the pause level should not affect how effects display, but they do. So if you want to avoid having that little shift happen, then you need to have these guys line up, like clicking on one to two for both of them like that. But I'm gonna keep mine at the default settings because I wanna make sure that mine match what most folks have when they're watching this course. So I'm gonna close this down now. And just be aware that as you go through this lesson and other lessons, if you see a shift on something when I click on an effect, it's because of that playback and pause setting back inside preferences. There are three median filters. This is the largest of the three. Median filters soften things. So the seven by seven version softens it a lot. Makes it kind of like a Gaussian blur there to a certain degree. And you can't control it either other than using the opacity slider. And there are two Technicolor effects here. One's called the two strip, one's the three strip, kind of emulating old Technicolor film stock. I'll click on that. Takes the purple and turns it green. Not sure you want to do that, but that is called Technicolor. Then there's the Technicolor three strip. It offers much richer colors, kind of like super Kodachrome. All right, let's move over to this other one over here. These tend to be like Photoshop effects. We'll click on emboss first. This looks for edges based upon the color and contrast. You can adjust that down here. Again, when you click, it's more extreme than the final result. All right, turn that off. Crayon drawing is similar in that it finds edges like that. Again, you can change things based on the color channels. More or less extreme. Copper plate. It starts off as copper plate, but you can change the color. Look at the three color wheels there. This one's called specular, and it's pointed toward red. If I point it down toward purple, it'll change to purple. I can change the diffuse as well, and I can add some ambience. We can adjust the emboss level again, just like the emboss effect, based on color channels like that. It's kind of interesting to combine copper plate with the crayon drawing, which works like so. And if I put crayon drawing above copper plate, watch what happens. It basically covers it up because crayon drawing is opaque, whereas copper plate is not. We'll turn that off. Sobel operator has no controls, but it too finds edges, but you can control the level over here, the opacity side of things. Outline is not a very good effect. It's kind of like the crayon effect, but doesn't work very well. It's kind of sloppy looking, as you can see there. Inversion allows you to invert based on color channels, red, or green or blue or some combination of the above until it looks like a photographic negative. There are two night effects. FX night, the one above there is called day to night. Each one attempts to turn a daytime scene into a nighttime scene. I prefer night over day to night, even though day to night has more controls. If you look at night, it has this color control here with a luma around the outside. So it can move this luma to make it a little bit brighter. And it's kind of difficult to grab the triangle down in the lower left-hand corner or the lower right-hand corner there. Basically, all you need to do is go to the top of the controller and click. It's much easier to control it that way. And you can change the color too, but blue works well for a nighttime shot like this. I could pull it toward red, but you see that it doesn't look right for night. Let's go to day two night here. This has more controls. The same kind of control over here in terms of the ambient. I slide it to the right or the left. Not much is going to happen yet until I go over here. And I can roll this up by the color channels and begin to darken things. But notice how the sky stays bright. It doesn't work as effectively as night, I think. Go over here and move this guy around a bit like that. Darker or lighter, like so. Turn that off. We've got sepia tone. We've seen that already. But you should know that it's not just sepia tone. I can take the slider, move it around, and change to other colors as well. Much more dramatic down here. And that looks a little overdone, right? But you can take this top slider and move it left to kind of bring that back just a little bit so it's not so extreme. There is a tint effect. It works a little bit differently. It allows you to change the color and then select the blending mode. So I pull this to the right here. Not much will change until I reduce the tonality. Right now it's very bright. You begin to see how the tint works, but it needs to be darker for it to be all that effective. But if you change the blending mode, it can be effective in different ways. So I go, let's say, to screen. I need to pull this guy to the left for it to work, right? Subtract is kind of interesting. Try that one. Again, you can move things left and right here to decide which one's going to work best for you in terms of tonality and the color. Bleach bypass tends to emulate a film processing technique where you skip the bleach process and you get this kind of gritty look here. 
You can decide whether you want to desaturate that even more by sliding that to the left. Takes the color out or add some more color. And you can adjust the gain by adjusting this left and right, and also adjust the color overall. But I think the default setting for bleach bypass works pretty well to emulate that particular process. Bloom is a fairly complex looking thing, but it basically makes things glow. If you increase the intensity, that's where you start seeing the glow coming in. Then you can adjust what's called the radius, threshold, and the blend. Gaussian blur is what you'd expect. So you kind of have to zone in on what you want there one little bit at a time until you decide that's going to work or not. Turn that off. The Gaussian blur range is much more complex. It's got the same kind of blur radius as the Gaussian blur, but a lot more controls. There's soften, which is kind of like blur, but not so extreme. If I start pulling that up, it just kind of takes the edge off a little bit there. And finally, there's Sharpen, which works kind of like Emboss again. If you go back down to the bottom, we've kind of gone full circle here, back to Sharpen. If I start moving this, you'll see we get kind of that embossed look. If you go too far, it gets a little extreme. I zoom in a bit here by going from Fit to, let's say, 100%. You can see how that's working. It's going to take it from a soft look to that kind of embossed look. So there you go. There are all sorts of effects that you can apply to clips here inside SpeedGrade, effects that you won't necessarily find inside Premiere Pro. So using SpeedGrade kind of expands your horizon in terms of video effects.